Hello everybody and welcome to this workshop, The Feminine Way to Scale to Seven Figures and Beyond. I am so excited to have you here with me. Uh, my name is Sean Burton, for those of you that don't know me. Um, we are going to have a really powerful session today where we talk through um, what makes it different for women to be in business and how that impacts our ability to scale to seven figures. And I'm going to leave you with a 90-day plan that you can implement to get your practice unstuck and start to move you from where you are now to seven figures and beyond. So please know that you are in the right place. If you have an established private practice with two or more clinicians working for you. Um, if the majority of the business and marketing advice that you have been given feels completely out of alignment with your values and you know it makes you want to vomit rather than follow through with it, you're in the right space. Um, and most importantly, if you're an ambitious and heart centered practice owner who is set on building your business to seven figures and beyond in annual turnover but aren't really sure what is standing between you and achieving that so my name's Sean as I said it's so great to meet you all um I can see if you here a few here that I already know many that I don't my whole thing in life my purpose if you will is to help women in private practice to achieve exponential growth in a way that aligns with their feminine values and honours their family commitments. Um, I want you to be able to have the success you're seeking without the sacrifice that you think it's going to take from you and your family. And I want you to have the financial freedom by living and uh, to do all the things that you want to do and living by your values instead of feeling like you have to go against them in order to achieve that. Now, I'm not going to bore you with my life story, I promise. But I think it's important for me to share a little bit so that you understand um, why I feel that I'm in a position to talk to you about this and and the depth of my understanding of this battle or challenge or push pull of being a mum in business. So this is me, 2019, like nearly four years ago now, um, running my business. I started my business after I was made redundant when I was 34 weeks pregnant with my eldest here, a bit older than this now. Um, and... I didn't want to go back to the corporate grind. I didn't want to work 45, 50 hours a week and miss out on so much of her life. I'd waited until I was 30 to have a baby and I wanted to be able to show up as the mum that I wanted to be. And so I made the decision to start a business instead of going back to corporate and um, the rest, as they say, is history, right? So 2000 and um, 19 we fast forward to there um, I'd had a second baby a uh, little munchkin here um, and I just returned to work so September I just returned back to work she was about three months old at that point and I naively thought I could just drop back into my business as it had been and that um, I'd be able to continue doing things just as I've been doing them uh, and had no idea how different it was going to be <laughs> like any of you have got two or more kids know that this is ridiculous like um, it is a whole different ball game with two kids instead of one. Uh, and to say it was a juggle is quite an understatement. I um, started to outsource some things and I was bringing on some support, but I was still doing more than I wanted to be doing. Um, and I worked around like Lola for another four months. But by January 2020, I made the decision to put her into daycare and I, I really wanted to get stuck into my business and try and find a bit more balance by working um like more consistently across some days rather than it being everywhere. And then in March, COVID happened and um, things just stepped up another level, really. Like, luckily for me, my business really took off and has continued to take off in that time. And in 2020, we doubled the size of the business that year, which was amazing and like in line with the goals and what I wanted to achieve. But um, by the end of that year, I was a complete mess. I wasn't being the mum I wanted to be. Um, there was a lot of quote unquote success, but the sacrifice that was coming with it was huge. Um, I was such a long way from where I wanted to be when I started my business. I didn't have any freedom, didn't have any flexibility. Um, sure, I was making like, we were making half a million dollars in the business, but I could not at all see how I could scale that business to a million dollars revenue, which had always been my goal with the way that things were like there just wasn't I didn't have anything more to give like if you find yourself now in that situation where you're like well great we're here 
but I want to get to here and heck if it's taken this to get here I don't have that again to give to know that you're you're in the right space and we're going to be talking to that because that was where I was at I I couldn't give anymore I wanted to be more present but I also wanted to be able to build the business that I wanted to build and I was in this real um predicament of like well how do I do both like can I do both it seemed to me I couldn't do both but I'm here today to show you that you can and the reason it was so important to me as I'm sure it is for most of you was I wanted to be able to take time off with my kids and my husband as a family I wanted to be able to make memories I wanted to be able to travel overseas I wanted to be able to go back and see our family in the UK and be able to do that for like a month at a time and my business not die in the water as I did that um, I wanted to be able to be present with my kids. Like I still, to this day, like when I first started my business, I set the intention that I would have my kids home with me more than they were in care. And that meant working three days a week and having them home with me four days a week. I still, to this day, nearly seven years later, only work in my office three days a week so that I do have my Mondays and Fridays with my little munchkin here on the right. And we spend lots of time in play cafes. <laughs> And I've been able to be there for um, school shows and colour runs and um, dance pickups and um, all those things I know other parents struggle with because not every child has a parent at all of these things. But our daughter does. Like nine times out of ten, it's me. And, and very often it's me and my husband there. But she's never the child that doesn't have anybody there. Um, and I get to see and experience all those things it was so important to me and then from a personal point of view I wanted to have time to socialize with friends I wanted to have the headspace I didn't want to flake out on the sofa at the end of every day every week completely exhausted and not have any time left to to build these relationships which are so important to women of other women and having them in our community I wanted to be able to do that and I wanted to be able to enjoy that and I wanted to have the freedom and headspace to be present as a wife, partner. I wanted to give my marriage the time it desperately needed after becoming a mom a second time. Um, they pick up the scraps, our partners, our husbands, so often uh, because we don't have anything left to give. And I wanted to have more to give to my relationship. But possibly a bigger thing was that I wanted to help more women. I knew that I was making a massive impact in the lives of the, the women that you see here. Um, but we were only scratching the surface of what I thought was possible, but I couldn't comprehend scaling the practice to work with more people. And so I knew that I was um, not giving women the opportunity to find the help that they needed. And, and I felt deeply that that wasn't right too, that I had a responsibility when I knew I had something that worked so well to share it widely, but I was so scared that in doing so, I would have to sacrifice more that I didn't have to give. And that is all coupled, right, with these goals, this, this desire that I'd always had from the very first moment of um, opening my business. But in reality, as long as I can remember, to be able to do the things I wanted to do and to have the money and freedom to do them. I've always traveled. I desperately wanted to have my dream car. I wanted to build our dream home. I wanted to be able to, to fly, fly business class, to be able to do the things that I wanted to do. But that felt like it was um, becoming an impossible dream when I thought I knew what it was gonna take to create it. And I've, wasn't really willing to accept that I was like I'm not prepared to give up on these dreams and my goals I want to create these things but I want to do it in a way that is the way that I do it it's the way that Sean does it it's not someone else's way it's not in the um I'm not I'm not going to hustle I'm not going to grind I'm not going to sell myself I'm not going to um, treat people badly and use other people to leg my way up I'm not going to do those things. I'm going to achieve my goals and I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it in a way that honours my family rather than taking from them. And this, it was quite a foreign thing with all the coaches that I was coming across. Like I 
I spoke to lots and lots of male coaches in that time and they all pre-described the same th- idea of like you need to hustle you need to grind you need to work more um 10x your um workload get up at 4 a.m before your kids get up go to bed late if you're not doing um if you're going to bed before midnight and you're getting up after five then you're not really invested but that was the mindset of the coaches around until I found an amazing woman called Fabienne who had three kids who had built a multi-million dollar business and she did it very much aligned with her feminine values she she didn't hustle she didn't grind she spent time with her kids and I was lucky enough to find her and to learn about the difference between the masculine and feminine energies and how they show up in business and why so much of what I was being told just didn't resonate for me so I just want to take a moment to ask you here watching is the concept of the masculine and feminine energy something that you have heard of is it um you know something you're aware of that you've got much understanding of um I know some of you here we've spoken a bit you've been in um other workshops so you know my um my philosophy on this um some of you I see from social media so I know that I talk about this a lot um but is it just pop in the chat is it something that you are aware of have a deep understanding of or is it new to you so a drink while you do that my four-year-old sneezed in my face last week and so I have been unwell since <laughs> no you're on borrowed time when a four-year-old sneezes who's unwell sneezes at you and I lasted three and a half days that was how much time I had uh, so Rachel said no she hasn't heard of this before um Erica has and Julia has that makes sense because you're in space you're in um yeah so lots of no's so let's talk about the difference between the masculine and the feminine energy it has nothing to do with gender I just want to clarify that because um it can we assume immediately that masculine and feminine relates to male and female but it actually doesn't they're not um they're not actually associated we just have associated them as society we all have masculine and feminine energy in us and we use them at different points for different things they ideally want to be working in harmony together so that we can flip-flop between the two as needed um we will all generally feel more comfortable sitting in one energy often for women that is sitting in their feminine energy often for men that is sitting in their masculine energy but you can all recall a friend who is male and doesn't have any problems expressing his feelings is very nurturing um isn't particularly competitive um isn't like massively assertive they're just they're a bit more feminine and and we really relate to them equally we can all think of a woman who is strong and dominant and assertive and strategic and data driven and um, is more in that what we would think of as the masculine energy. We can all think of those men and women in the other way because it isn't gender related. It's more to do with what is more predominantly our energy. And so women are more inclined to be in their feminine energy. Women in health are even more inclined to be in their feminine energy because of the nature of the role. It's a healing, nurturing, compassionate role you're more likely to see women in those roles. Um, That's why you see more female nurses. It's why we see more female speech pathologists. All throughout it tells, um, we see more women. So let's talk about what the differences are between these energies. So the feminine energy is about nurturing. It's about being supportive. It's about collaboration and community. It's about compassion. It's about thriving together rather than competing. It's about being in flow. And following what feels good. It's about trusting our intuition and following that rather than following a pre described plan that someone else has set out for us. So, the masculine energy, in contrast, is about being assertive, it's about being dominant, it's about um, being analytical and data-driven and strategic it's about um striving instead of resting it's about um systems and processes rather than following flow 
and being analytical rather than following intuition that's more of the masculine energy now I'm sure that many of you here can, will feel that you sit more in those feminine um, energy um, characteristics that's more probably feels like who you are but you can probably think of a woman who's more in her masculine energy like I know I certainly was when I was in corporate because that's what you're told you need to be to be successful um, and equally men who are in the allied health space are really really comfortable in those feminine um, energy val and, and really lives those values so like I said it really just isn't about gender it's about um the energy that we show up with so and this is where the challenge comes from right so if you are more um predominantly in your feminine energy and you are looking for support and coaching and, and, and advice and information on how you grow your business and you reach out to the male coaches in the space because they are predominantly males particularly in allied health but kind of across the board when you're looking for coaching there is something about the male coaches in the allied health space and um and then being more dominant in their masculine energy than you would necessarily see men be generally in society and i do wonder if it's because they are surrounded by um so many women and therefore sit more in their masculine energy to create more polarity particularly as they're the owners um but what it does when you're as a business owner and you're looking for help and they're very dominantly in their masculine energy and then they start telling you about how they run their business like that and how you should run your business from their energy it's like oil and water right it's like they're telling you stuff and you're just like Ooh, like I'm not gonna do that that's awful like I'm not gonna um slash my admin team's wages because they're um higher than they should be and it's cutting into my profit because they're single mums and they need that money I'm not gonna do that I'm not gonna um cut my team's appointments down to 20 minutes because that's going to affect the customer experience and the care that they get and so we get to this situation where it's um, it feels very alien, very unaligned with our values. And then it can lead to a point where women feel like to be successful, they either need to sacrifice their values or give up on like give up on their goals. Like you can't be successful if you don't if you can't do it this way. And I've had women be told this. If you're not going to do it like this and you're not going to use our templates then you're not going to achieve the goals you're looking for. It's just nonsense. It's just makes me really angry. Um because you can build a very, very successful business in a feminine way. And I'm going to show you example after example today of women who have done this. Because if you can leave with just that belief today, then I will have done my job well. What I want you to think about as a final kind of thought on this masculine feminine thing is what resonates more for you? Do would you rather be positioning yourself in your field as the best? And um, spending big dollars on advertising, trying to get your name out there working long hours, hustling for success, having a massive focus on analytics and dashboards and KPIs, um, following someone else's formula about how to grow your practice, whether that fits in with your goals and dreams or not, and sacrificing time with your family? Or would you rather be being empathetic, creating emotional connection with your audience and community, collaborating with other professionals to create win-win situations, um, fostering meaningful relationships with peers, focusing on your vision and mission and letting them guide you and your team as to where the practice goes and allowing more ease and flow in your business and life. What would you rather be doing? Pop in the chat, um, A or B. I'm just going to have a drink while you do that. So yeah, B. No one really wants A, we all want B. Understandably, right? Like nobody wants to be building their business from that place. And so then the question becomes, would you rather be focused on how can I serve in a bigger way or let's go crush it to um, reference Gary B, if you may or may or not have heard of him, but he is definitely an epitome of that masculine energy um, and a very loud voice on how to be successful in business out there in the out there in the business world, um, you know, in amongst other people like Donald Trump and Alan Sugar in the UK and, and you know, um, Rupert Murdoch here in Australia. Like that's what we're told is success. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because imagine if you learned how to create marketing, which attracted dream clients into your practice, but did it in a way that felt authentic and aligned with your values. 
and filled your team up. And imagine if you um, built a thriving team who are invested in your vision and excited about helping you bring it to life. Imagine if you develop scalable systems that allows you to take time off and the practice still grow in your absence. And you found a way to work smarter, not harder, so that you could achieve the exponential growth you're looking for, but still be home with your family. Because that's what it's all about, right? Most of us started our businesses to be home with our family. And I want to stop here and just share a little story with you about Sarah. Um, Sarah's a speech pathologist. She lives um, just outside Portland in Oregon. When we first met, it was right in the thick of COVID. And Sarah was trying to run her practice. She was homeschooling her kids. She had a partner working really long hours in a job he hated, and he was really not loving life. She really wanted to open a second practice in Portland because she was um, just outside. But she was like, I am spread so thin right now. Something needs to change, but I don't even know if I've got the time to invest to do it. And I was like, you absolutely can. I just need an hour a week from you, and we can turn this around completely. So she trusted me. She came into the program. Within six months, she doubled the size of her practice, doubled her revenue, she opened a brand new clinic in another city within that six months. Um, she continued to homeschool her kids and was able, in fact, within 12 months to retire her husband from his corporate job that he hated and bring him into the business. Now, fast forward a bit because I created this slide a little while ago, but um, Sarah's now coming up for three years from being out of the program. She's hit one million turnover. I think she was at about 250,000 when we first started working together. Um, she works half the time that she used to. Her and her husband took a month off last summer to travel around the states that surrounded their, their um, where they live with their kids. They both pulled wages out of the practice that month. Neither of them worked. They took the month off. The practice was fine. And she said to me when she messaged me, she was like, you're never going to believe what we're doing right now. I would never have dreamed this would be possible to be able to take a month off and travel with the kids and and the practice still be doing really well. And it was it was from her being able to sit in her feminine energy and, and make changes to the practice from that place that allowed them to create this magical dream practice that she'd always hoped for. So I want that for you too. And if you're not at seven figures yet, it's because there are one of three areas or more in your practice that are not working well and therefore hindering your ability to grow. What we're going to do today is figure out which ones of these um, areas are not working in your practice, the exact reasons that they're not working, so you can leave with a plan of what you need to work on and what you need to fix in order to go from where you are now to start moving towards your dream practice and your seven-figure revenue if that's what you want it to be. So the first of these three is around magnetic marketing. Now, Marketing is the bit that people really hate. <laughs> people are like, I know I should be marketing, but I don't know what to do. And every time I think about doing stuff, it makes me feel like oh, I just don't want to do it and it's horrible. So we don't really do it. But if marketing could be about being nurturing and empathetic and collaborative and building relationships and building trust, and you could attract people to your practice instead of pushing yourself out into the community and, and trying to um, get referrals. It said you attracted referrals. How different would that be? Like imagine being in control of the referrals coming into your practice and knowing that month in, month out, you get 10 referrals from four or five referral partners. And that if you want to scale the practice, all you need to do is find another four or five referral partners like those to bring in another 10 referrals, now you're doubling the size of the practice because there's twice as many new clients coming in every single week. Imagine what that does in your business. The next area is around having a thriving team. If you are putting out fires constantly and issues and challenges and conflicts, um, your team isn't thriving right now. That's consuming a huge amount of your time and energy and stopping the practice from moving forward. What we want is a team who are inspired by your vision and are accountable for the part they play in it and who are invested in running the practice in a way that aligns with your values. That allows you then to nurture a great team to success. 
you can collaborate together and it becomes a joy to have people in your business instead of where people say to me, oh, if I just didn't have to manage team, then my practice would be fine. Having a thriving team gets to be something that's enjoyable about your business instead of your team being a drain on you. And the final area is about having scalable systems. So systems will save you. This is like something I constantly say in, in the program in Success Without Sacrifice to our clients. Without systems, you become the bottleneck for everything. And yes, systems are more in that masculine energy, but by having systems in place, we're able to be able to be in flow and to follow our intuition because we know the foundation is covered. We know that the quality of service um, people are experiencing is good and we can therefore look forward to what next. We can we can be inspired, we can um, be in flow and we can follow the breadcrumbs when we don't have to worry about things um, imploding behind us, right? So if your systems aren't working, you're not going to be able to take any amount of time out of your business. You won't be able to go for a month's break. You definitely wouldn't be able to go for maternity leave. And that's what we want for you. We want you to be able to have that lifestyle, <clears throat> that success without the sacrifice. And so how this shows up is that if you have magnetic marketing and scalable systems, you get reliable growth. You get to know we have a system around our marketing and we have consistent growth because of it. We have consistent client numbers coming in. That means we can grow and scale. When you have magnetic marketing and a thriving team, you get engaged clients. Your clients are happy. They've come to the right place. They're getting the service they wanted. They're being treated by therapists who are really invested. They're happy and they tell other people about you. When you have scalable systems and a thriving team, you get business freedom because you can step out of the practice. You don't have to be there all the time. You get to go on those breaks and have that time and space because you've created that freedom. And it takes having all three of them working really well to create success without sacrifice, <laughs> which is what I want for you. So let's look at knowing if this is what's needed to build a thriving seven figure practice. Let's look at what it looks like when it's not working. And I'd love for you to think about which of these is you and to pop it in the chat. So if you have scalable systems and magnetic marketing, you don't have a thriving team, you end up overworked because you've got too many referrals coming in, you don't have enough team, or the team you have aren't working effectively. And the best systems in the world are not gonna stop you firefighting and you're working massive weeks because you're trying to deal with the team issues, see the clients, um, so, you know, work with your admin, you, you just end up completely overworked. If you have a thriving team and scalable systems, but your marketing isn't working, you become overstretched. So you don't have enough money coming in and financially things get difficult because you're paying your team and to be there, but they're not seeing as many clients as they should be. And again, the best systems in the world aren't going to bring in clients unless you're doing marketing. And I see this a lot, like people be like, they've got their systems absolutely nailed down, but they're not marketing. And so then financially, it's really, really difficult. That's one of the most common things I think I see. And then the final thing is if you've got a great team and great marketing, but you don't have systems in place, you will become completely overwhelmed because everything falls back to you. You're the bottleneck for everything. You have to approve everything. And there just aren't enough hours in the day. You're seeing clients, you're managing your team, and you're trying to do all the operational stuff. You just end up completely overwhelmed. So which of those three feel most like you right now? You've got some overworked overstretched overstretched is very common this is probably the most common one I see is overstretched yeah yeah so a bit of overwhelm a bit of overworked but a lot of overstretched and so now let's talk about how you go from where you are now to that seven figure revenue because we know these things need to be working you're like great but how do I get these things working so I know that there are nine core activators, three for each, which impact these things in your practice being a reality. And so what we're gonna to do today 
is look at each of those and identify where you have challenges and where you are stuck so that we know which key areas aren't working for you right now and are standing between you and your next revenue goal. Because these are the things that stop you from growing. If you've got all of these things working well, in fact, you don't need to have, even need to have all of these things working well. You just need to have most of them working well. You will be at seven figures. And if you're not, it's because many of these are um, not where they need to be. You'll leave today with a um, clarity around which of those areas aren't where they need to be. You'll have some priorities from that. And then from that, you can identify what you need to work on in the next 90 days to change things. And that was my promise to you, right? That you would leave with a 90 day plan. So let's dig into this. We're going to start with marketing. And if you follow me for a while or know anything about me, you'll know that marketing is my background. I was a corporate, um, I was in corporate as a marketing director for 12 years. Um, and I have taken everything I know about uh, building trust with an audience. And I have overlaid it to what is the most historical way to fill a practice and created a system that is um, allows you to be consistent and um, and work smarter, not harder, and just do the things that make the difference. And we're going to talk about them today. So referral streams is the number one thing that I talk about in marketing and practice. If you take away the last 15 years of the internet and social media and Google ads and Facebook ads, and you talk to anybody who started a practice in the 90s, and I do regularly, or 2000s, they will tell you that they built their practice by building relationships in the community and nurturing those relationships on a regular basis. We have lost that in all this noise of post on social media every day, have a content strategy, run a Google ad strategy, um, go and visit the GPs. Like, we have lost this um, piece around referral partnerships and the power of them. And so it's foundational to having magnetic marketing is having consistent referral streams that you nurture. And that's important because if you don't have consistent referral streams, you can't make business decisions effectively. If you have ever thought about maybe hiring another team member and then held off because you don't know if you're going to have clients for them and you don't have to pay out their salary and have no clients for them to see. You do not have this nailed down. When you have this nailed down and you know every month you get 10 referrals from these referral partners, you know that all you need to do is go and find more referral partners like those to bring in more referrals if that's what's needed. But you can also forecast. Like if you know that every single month you get 10 referrals, let's say, and your team have capacity for 10 more clients and they turn over every six weeks, you can forecast when your team will be formed, when there's going to be a wait list and know exactly when you need to make a new hire. And if that's soon, then you can start the process now as opposed to getting completely overwhelmed with clients, trying to find someone in that headspace, sometimes making a bad hire because you desperately need somebody. Um, and then potentially having a point in the future where you can't afford to pay them because there aren't enough clients. Like that's what stresses people out. Equally, we're trying to figure out what size of building to move into. Like I've had many clients buy buildings and they'll be like, I'm going to buy a three room building. And I'm like, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> we're going to forecast over the next three years, how many clients you will potentially have. And that will give you an idea of what size of practice you need. I had one client who was going to buy a three room space I talked her into buying a six room space and now less than a year later, she's purchasing another four rooms off the back and a gym because she's even filled up the space that she had. You can't make business decisions if you don't have consistent referrals coming in. So you are green with this and good to go if you know exactly where your referral partners come, referrals come from and who your key partners are and you have a marketing system in place to nurture those and to create more. Um, if you, um, you can mark yourself as yellow and just write this down because um, I do want you to keep a track of how you scored yourself. You are yellow if you know who some of your referral partners are and you sometimes check in with them, but you wouldn't know how to grow them if you needed to. And then you are red 
if you don't know who your referral partners are and you do nothing to build new referral relationships. So just write down where you scored yourself there. The next thing around marketing is consistent communications. We want to um, attract people to us by building trust and being authentic and collaborating. And the only way to do that is by being consistent with your marketing communications, consistent with your clients, consistent with your referral partners, and consistent with um, being out in the community and sharing what you do. That is how you build trust. People keep you top of mind. And you are able to attract clients in to your practice. Now, you are green here if you consistently um, send out marketing communications to your referrers, your clients, and you have a plan around how you'll be doing that for the rest of the year. You are yellow here if sometimes you send things out, but it's really ad hoc and inconsistent. And you are red if you don't send any marketing communications out at all. So just write down where you are there. And then the final area of marketing that we're going to score you, you're going to score yourself on is about leveraging your network and your team's network. This is low-hanging fruit, right? Trust is already established with people you know. This might be people you've worked with. It might be people you um, went to school with or uni with. It might be people you play sports with. It's not about being like an MLM -er and and asking people like to refer to you it's about tapping into your network and asking who they know that they could introduce you to or potentially could refer to you themselves if that is you know the right situation but it's about building building collaborative relationships right um and tapping into the people who you already know so often people go out to what we would call the cold audience their immediate thought is like well I'll put some Google ads up I'll go and see the local GP and they forget that their cousin's mother-in-law is on the board of the special education department or that their um, aunt's new husband is a surgeon and that they could be contacting them about um, referrals post-surgery we just skip right on by that and we go to the people who don't know us and we miss a massive opportunity so you're green here if you are actively leveraging your um, your network and your team's network to build new referral streams and to um, bring new clients into the practice. You are yellow if you um, have tapped into some of your own network, but not in a really structured way and not for a while. And you are red if you have never thought about this before and I am sharing something completely new with you. And I want to stop here and just share a, a story with you about Kalonda because Kalonda really embraced this marketing piece. It was her biggest challenge when we first met um, a little over a year ago. She had a single room clinic and one part-time member of staff this time last year when we started working together. She desperately wanted to have a second baby, but just did not have the revenue in her practice to support her taking time off. And she's like, this thing's just gonna grind to a halt if I'm not seeing clients. We formulated a marketing strategy to generate um, clients coming into the practice on a regular basis. We took her, because we had that consistent client flow, from 1.5 team members a year ago to seven team members now. She's gone from $150,000 revenue to being on track to do $720,000 revenue. And she made $60,000 this month alone. That was like almost half of her revenue for the year previously. Um, her revenue has grown four times in the time that we've worked together from about 15k up to that 60,000. She's opened a six room clinic because she had the ability to forecast when she would um, need to bring new team on and the confidence to take that lease on that six room clinic. And she's gone on to hit all of her dreams and so much more like she would say to you, I never envisaged that I could create this in a year. That can be you too by fixing your marketing and, and implementing magnetic marketing. So let's talk about systems. <clears throat> um, the first part of systems is documentation. Um, the documentation of therapy, communication, um, how things work in your practice. It's the feminine way to empower people to take ownership of their role and to show up in the practice when they have clear guidance around what they should be doing and how we do things here and to what standard. 
um it's fundamental in you being able to maintain the quality standards that you want and to ensure that things are done how you want them to be done if you have team and they're not doing things how you want them to be done or to the standard they you want them to be done ask yourself have i put documentation in place that explains how this should be done without documentation we also end up managing people not systems because if you're asking someone to figure out how to do a job or to do it from memory in the way that you've told them you're reliant on them having initiative follow through um to stay focused uh you know it's about you can end up asking yourself like why can't they figure this out but they shouldn't have to figure it out right we can be much more in our feminine energy and of nurturing them to follow a system as opposed to being in our masculine energy of performance managing them when we have this stuff in place. Because if someone's not adhering to a well-documented system, it's not personal. It's just, okay, can you tell me what's going on here? Why are we not able to follow this system? What's the problem? Where are you getting stuck? As opposed to why can't you do this properly, which is very personal and is why most women shy, shy away from managing their team because we, it, it goes against our nature to pull people apart and, and highlight their flaws, right? And without documentation, we can't delegate. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you delegate, um, and oh, sorry, I just realized I didn't tell you how to squeeze up. Let's go back to this. So um, you are green in documentation if you have an operations manual with, where everything to this point in time is documented and you know pretty much up to date. This is never a done job you constantly change and evolve your documentation based on how you're doing things in the practice and, and systems change and grow as the practice grows. But for now, there's an operations manual and it's pretty much up to date, that's green. You're yellow if you have some systems documented or processes documented, but they're not in one place um, and they're not clearly um, easy to find and follow. And you're red if you really like everything's in your head and nothing is documented yet. So then to go on to delegation, you can't delegate if you don't have documentation in place because delegation is about is about creating a system and process for a task and then passing that task off to another team member for them to follow that system or process. It's not about telling someone, hey, can you can you start doing this job for me because I don't want to do it anymore. They don't have enough information there to do it to the standard that you want or in the way you want. And that means they won't complete it, either they won't complete it at all, or they won't complete it to the standard you want it to be done or to the timeline you want it to be done or in the way you want it to be done. And that's where delegation falls down um, and often doesn't get completed. So delegation is the thing that lets you remove yourself from the practice. If you can't delegate your roles effectively or your tasks, you're gonna be tied to that practice forever. And nailing it down is what gives you the freedom to be able to move, walk away and take that time out. So you're green with delegation. If you create systems and processes to hand off tasks, those tasks are handed off to your team. They complete them on time and to the standard you expect. You're yellow here. If you're able to delegate some things to your team and some of them get finished, some of them get finished really well, but it's hit and miss. And so you constantly have to follow up on everything to make sure it's been done and how well it's been done. That makes you a yellow. You're red here. If you um, don't have, um, if you don't delegate, it's all in your head. You struggle with losing control, and um, none of this is moving forward. Right, that would make you a red. So just pop down what you are in that field. And so then the final piece of scalable systems is about integration, and this is the one that catches most people out. Um, there is no way to free you up from your practice for any period of time if you don't have a practice manager or a very senior admin at the least. And the number one thing I see people do here that's a mistake is to promote a good admin into a practice manager role because there's a very different um, approach and mindset and skill set to being a practice manager and being organized and good at following systems is not it. It's about having the initiative to create the systems and to improve the systems and to make things more productive and effective. That is the skill set of a, an integrator or a practice manager. And I see practice managers at seven figures who haven't got this figured out. So if you don't have this figured out, you don't have a practice manager yet, and you are um, you know, five, four or five team members, 
know that you're not alone, but you do really need to start to think about this. If you only have a couple of team members, then a senior admin is absolutely going to be fine for now. But it is something that you need to have on your radar that in the future, if you want to scale to seven figures, you have to have a practice manager unless you want to sacrifice all of your time for money. And so um, you are red here if you don't have a practice manager um, and uh, don't have any intention yet of getting one. You're yellow here if you have a practice manager, but they um, they need quite a lot of support and they are maybe more of a senior admin than that person who is going to take a project and run with it. And you're green if you have a right hand person who you could say to them tomorrow, I want to overhaul the onboarding system for our new team. Here's what I'm thinking. They go away. They create a project plan. They delegate out the tasks. They tell you what you need to do. Um, they pull it all together and they put a bow on it for you and deliver back a new onboarding system. That's green. And that is what we would love to get all of you to, because that's where you get to step out of the practice for six months and have a baby and not worry about the practice falling over while you go. And I want to share Susan and Carla's story at this point, because um, they were very, very successful on paper. They had a team of 15. They were turning over more than a million dollars a year, but they were working evenings and weekends and the sacrifice that was coming in their business was huge. Um, we made some changes to their team. We brought in an integrator or practice manager, proved their systems, removed them as the bottlenecks, and they were able to free up enough time to launch an online course that they'd wanted to do for years. And they also grew their revenue and profit by 50%. It was almost all profit. They now only work two days a week and they no longer talk about their practice being a set of golden handcuffs because now they make the great money and they have the time to enjoy it. So let's look about look at um, Thriving Team finally. This is about having the right people in the right seats first. And what I mean by that is nurturing people to work to their strengths, making sure that everybody in the team knows um, their role and that their role is designed for them to fulfill them and to get the best out of them. It's about empowering people to show up as their best selves and to really thrive in their role. So you're green here if you have everyone in your team in the role that plays to their strengths and no one's doing anything that they're not great at and um, they're fulfilled and happy and really loving their work. You're yellow if some people are doing things that they're good at and their strengths, but they're also doing some things that aren't right for them. Um, but you're, you know, you're starting to work towards moving those roles. And you're red here. If you um, have people just working in roles because that's the role they were given and they're not necessarily the right fit and someone else might be better at doing some of those things, but that's just how it is. So score yourself there. And then let's look at the second part of Thriving Team, which is expectations and accountability. Now, it might seem odd because most people think of accountability being around KPIs and dashboards. But just like with kids, if you're a mum, people thrive with boundaries and understanding what the expectations are and being held accountable to that. And without that, the team will um, take liberties a bit because that's human nature. Like if we think we can get away with doing something, we will. If, you, if there's four hours to do admin, I'm gonna take four hours to do my admin. If I know that the expectation is I get it done in two, and I'm being held accountable to that, then I'm going to do it in two. It's not that they're bad people. It's just that we do, we want to make our life easier. And so accountability and expectations are so important. So you're green here if you have job descriptions for all of your team. Everybody knows what the expectations are of their role. And they have regularly held accountable to um, key metrics that show you that they're performing in that role. You're yellow if you have some job descriptions. Um, but they're old and outdated and people don't really know what's going on with them and that there isn't much accountability around those job descriptions and you're red if job descriptions are something you've not even really thought about um, and nobody's really being held accountable um, to those expectations so mark yourself there as to red yellow or green okay so finally let's talk about intentional culture culture is made and created it's not a given and it takes intention and it's the key to having a thriving team 
Like if your culture is good, you can get away with out having amazing expectations and accountability stuff and without people being quite in the right seats. But you could have those two things be perfect. And if your culture is wrong, it's just your team is not going to thrive. And so intentionally setting a culture is about knowing what you value and hiring people who are aligned with those values and living and breathing those values day to day. So you're green if you have um, values clearly written out and articulated and your team live and breathe them and your clients could give me, um, uh, could tell me what they feel and experience with your practice and it would be close to your values. You are yellow if you have some values, but you're not super clear on what they were because they've been in a drawer for a while and your team probably wouldn't remember them and you're red if you've never done any work on your values in the past so I want you to um, score yourself there red green or yellow while you do that um, I just want to share a story with you about Kieran so Kieran was ready to quit her practice and walk away she said to me when I first spoke to her like I don't know why I don't just stop I don't know why I don't just close the practice go and treat out someone else's room like I used to I'd be making way more money and it'd be way less stress she wanted to go off and have another baby, but the team was not thriving at all. Um, everything was still landing with her, even though she had three admins and she wasn't making enough money in the practice to be able to step out. But we grew her revenue for 50 by 50 percent while she was pregnant. And we created this amazing team culture where everybody stepped up and was willing to drive the practice forward in her absence because they were bought into her vision. Um, she went off and had her baby and came back six months later and the practice had grown in the time that she was off. Can you imagine that? Like actually having six months off and then the practice growing. And it's because the more we align with our feminine energy and focus on our purpose and our vision and who we are here to serve, the faster our practices grow and the more impact we're able to have. And so from what you have gone through today, I want you to really um, take stock of where in your business and where in your practice these things are not um, where they should be. You're going to have some areas that maybe are red or at least yellow that you need to place your attention on. And then from those, which do you feel are the most important things to work on in the next three months? What are your biggest challenges right now? If you have team that's sitting at 50% capacity and you are yellow or red down here, then this is your focus. If you're working 60 hours a week but making great money, then up here is your focus. And if you're, um, this practice seems to be running pretty well, but your time is being sucked up with team challenges, then here is where you need to focus. And it might, it might be that it's one from each of them, but if you're not making enough money, then I would encourage you to focus on marketing first. Um, so you should from that then have an idea what's the first thing you're going to work on in the first 30 days the next 30 days and the next 30 days three will be a game changer to your practice you don't need to do all of these to make a difference um Susan and Carla didn't even have all these things perfect at seven figures so it doesn't all need to be perfect but we do need to get you unstuck and so picking three things that are the biggest challenges for the next 90 days will allow you to start to move forward and to get unstuck and to put the things in place that are gonna make a difference. Because I want you to achieve results like the ladies I've shared with you today. And you can do it in as little as two hours a week. Like the most common thing I hear is like, I don't have time, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm so overworked. It literally takes a couple of hours a week to work on one thing at a time, to move your practice forward and to create the practice of your dreams. And it's really just a case of having a plan so you know where to focus and can maximize your effort. Now, I know that um, we've given you a bit of a plan from here. But if you want more help with that plan, then I'm more than happy to chat. Because the other thing is having support around you is fundamental for us as women, right? It's a plan, that's the mas masculine, but it's the support, it's the collaboration and someone to nurture us and hold us accountable that's also really, really important for us to be successful. So if creating a plan and having support to execute that plan is something you would like help with, then um, I'm gonna just take a minute and share with you about my Success Without Sacrifice Mastermind program that all the women that I've shared with you today have worked through and that we have 50, 60 plus women through working through at the moment. Um, 
Uh, it is a feminine focused program. We only have women in there. Everything that we do in there is around marketing and systems and creating a team in a way that aligns with feminine values, not the masculine way. And doing it in the way that you want to build your business. There is no pre-described way that I teach in the program. All I do is give you the tools to fix the issues that you have that are keeping you stuck. But to do so in a way that builds the practice you want. Like we have women who work 50 hours a week and they love it. I have women who work two days a week and they love it. I have women who have huge practices um, because they, that's their goal. I have pra- women who have small practices because that's their goal. There is no one size fits all, but there are common challenges that keep you stuck that the program helps you to move through. And so we do that by providing you with online course content so you never have to try and um, figure things out on your own. There is no more trial and error. We tell you how to do everything. People are like, well, um, is there something on this? Yep, there's absolutely something on building job descriptions. Is uh, I need to hire my practice manager. Is there modules on that? Yes, there is. You don't need to guess anymore. Because the common thing I hear is like, I'm a therapist. I'm not a business owner. I don't know how to do this. So you get to tap into my knowledge and expertise with 15 years of commercial experience, but also the knowledge and expertise of the other women in the program who are, you know, potentially ahead of you or, um, more experienced in an area that you, that you aren't and vice versa. Um, we have, there's one-to-one coaching with me included in the program. We have powerful group coaching calls where um, you get to uh, tap into my knowledge and tap into the other women in the program's knowledge. We give you access to a personal financial success strategist so they can really help you own your numbers in a way that aligns with your feminine values so that we can empower you to make great business decisions. Um, And there's a community of like-minded practice owners there to mean that you do get that collaborative support and you do have that community that I know so many women desperately crave in business and really struggle to find. So if that feels like something that might be what you're looking for right now, um, pop me a message on Facebook or um, LinkedIn or um, through email. You can respond to any of the emails you've received from us um, or just hunt me down on social media and um, booking a call and I would love to help you get even clearer than we have today on where you're stuck and where you're trying to get to and to help you figure out how you go about doing that um, in a way that will align with your values and your family commitments but to help you build that seven figure practice and beyond um, that you dream of but maybe you felt like it's not been possible so if you want to have a chat about that, would love to speak to you. Um, feel free to reach out and um, get something booked in. Um, I would love to hear from you what has been great about today and what has been most valuable. You can pop that in the chat or if anybody wants to come on live. Yeah, so Heather said, wow, I to just have the confirmation that I can do it in a feminine way is amazing that is all I want you to take from today like sure I would love to work with some of you but as I said at the beginning my purpose and passion is to help more women know that they can build a practice the way they want to in a way that aligns with their values and if that's what you've taken from today Heather I have done my job and I am happy so I'm glad that that is what you've taken from today lots of the people saying um seeing that there's another way to do things um knowing that they're on the right track, knowing exactly what to work on. Yep, I hear you, Erica. Um, seeing, seeing that I can do it and the steps to take, great. Yeah, so lots of people saying they got a lot of value from the plan and excited to get started. So I'm so, so grateful to have spent this time with you. So pleased that um, I get to share this information with you. And like I just said, so honored that I get to shift your perception and send you back out into the world with a view that is different to what you've been told to this point and that actually you are very capable of achieving everything you've set your heart on and doing it in a way that aligns with your values um, and without having to make the sacrifice that you think you have to make so if that sounds like um, something you'd like help with and you'd like some more help with implementing your plan um, like I said, reach out to me about Success Without Sacrifice. I would love to chat with you more about it. Um, but otherwise, it's been a complete joy and pleasure to spend this time with you. 
And I really look forward to seeing some of you um, more in my Ambitious Women in Private Practice free Facebook group um, or I'm just around on social media, some of my other workshops. It would be lovely to see your faces again. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you have enjoyed it and it's been valuable. And I will leave you all to your day or your evening. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon.